Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. Hello, this is John Bicknell. Three brief announcements before we start today's discussion. First, IPA invites all authors and cognitive security thought leaders to contribute to our blog. And for the month of April 2023, we are soliciting submissions of original content related to large language models, or LLMs, and GPT-3 technologies, which if you're paying attention at all, are all over the news these days. How do these technologies affect human cognition? How may these technologies be used in helpful or harmful ways? If you have thoughts on these uh, very important topics, please consider contributing to our blog. And there will be a link in the show notes to uh, this announcement, as well as to our blog submission guidelines. And we ask that people contribute their submissions no later than April the 3rd. And we look forward to reading about all of your fantastic thoughts. Second, IPA uh, is kicking off this week, actually, Thursday, March the 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will be starting monthly brown bag meetings for IPA members only. Each of these virtual Zoom gatherings will feature a guest who will present on a topic related to cognitive security, information operations, uh, related policy matters, and other topics uh, related to the study advancement and application of information-related activities and technologies. Uh, as I mentioned, though, you're going to need to be an IPA member to join in on these discussions, and I can think of no better time to join IPA than right now and gain access to these uh, members-only forums. And that brings me to my third announcement, actually. If you are an IPA member listening to this, thank you very much. Uh, we send out periodic emails um, at least once a month, maybe twice a month, to all IPA members. And if you are not receiving emails from us, something is wrong. Either the email that you entered uh, when you joined IPA, per perhaps you're not monitoring that email very often. Perhaps you've changed organizations since you uh, registered with that email. Perhaps our emails are going to spam. So please check your, your spam account. Um, but regardless, we would like to make sure that you are receiving our communication. So if you're not, please send us a note and we will be sure to get that um, rectified. And also, um, if you're an IPA member and you're not part of our Slack community, we want to be sure you have the opportunity to join our Slack channel as well. Not only are there lots of engaging discussions going on related to information operations and cognitive security, but these uh, this is also where we're going to be uh, passing along to our members the Zoom link to join these monthly IPA member brown bag meetings. So uh, please let us know so that we can get our communications channels up and running with you. And finally, uh, I said three announcements. One last announcement. If you're getting value from these cognitive crucible discussions, uh, please consider rating us on iTunes or whatever platform you listen and leaving a review. Uh, these, believe it or not, these really are helpful uh, for other like-minded individuals to find the Cognitive Crucible and uh, hear about what what, uh, the, hear about the fantastic discussions that we're having, like the one that's coming up here in just a moment with Tom Ferris from Texas A&M. Uh, this is not just a United States problem. It's not a Department of Defense problem. It's not just a national security problem. It is a Western society and uh, uh, free societies of the world 
problem. And the more people who uh, know about IPA and who are tied into what we are doing and who are participating, the better. And so please do rate us on iTunes or whatever platform you listen. Tell, tell your friends and colleagues about IPA. Encourage them to join. And um, we have so many fantastic initiatives that are underway right now. Just a quick little recap. Uh, uh, not only are we kicking off these monthly brown bag meetings, but we're also looking at pushing out a uh, double blind peer reviewed cognitive security journal later this year. We're looking at forming regional chapters this year. Um, we are, uh, we're intimately involved in the Phoenix Challenge Conference Series, which is um, uh, 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 sponsored by the United States Department of Defense. And um, we're working very closely with one of our uh, uh, dear partners, uh, the Applied Research Lab for Intelligence and Security, ARLIS, uh, in uh, putting on the Phoenix Challenge Conference Series. There's another one that's coming up in the end of June. And so if you're interested in participating in that conference, we will be having more information uh, being released shortly about that. If you're interested in sponsoring IPA as a corporate sponsor, uh, please uh, get in touch with us so that you can uh, get plugged into the um, the uh, June Phoenix Challenge conference uh, uh, planning meetings. And oh, by the way, this conference is going to be hosted at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. So lots of great things on the horizon. And we would love to have uh, you along uh, and uh, contributing and being part of all of this. And now on to today's discussion. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Dr. Thomas Ferris, who is an Associate Professor of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Texas A&M University. Dr. Ferris's research interests are in human factors and cognitive ergonomics and can be described as the study of cognition in human machine engineered systems. Tom Ferris, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you so much, John. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Likewise, uh, so glad that you could join us. So the, the conversation that I'd like to have with you today will cover cognitive ergonomics. But before we get into this topic, um, I'd like to ask you if you could share your observations related to the technological advancements that we are experiencing and how global societies are being impacted. Great. Well, I, I can think of a, a couple of interesting ways that Current, uh, 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 currently, humans are advantaged by uh, technological changes, right? So the first one is that uh, we're all walking supercomputers these days because we all have, you know, our 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 cognitive uh, extensions here of our phones, which you know link us to the internet and and unlimited information, um, and the ability to do that, you know, is something that we overlook in terms of how um, how much that impacts our, our ability to, to converse and to, to exchange information. Um, and so, you know, with that access, as opposed to, I got to, you know, do any, any amount of research and effort as opposed to, I can just look it up, um, you know, changes dramatically are, you know, the way that we, we think about gathering information. Um, the other thing that is very interesting and, and, comes into my world a little bit as a academic is the influx of and really sophistication of artificial intelligence. And one example that's really a hot topic these days, I suppose, with uh, academics and students is a chat based AI, uh, chat GPT being one of them mm. as something that can, you know, generate prose uh, and essentially, you know, becomes artificial intelligence for communication. Um, and this is a tool I think that, you know, we we can take advantage of, you know, from the academic side of things, we look at it like, oh, this is a way that students could be, you know, cheating in the future or whatever, or finding new ways to to uh, to get around our, our grading schemes. I think instead we say this is a tool that's here to stay. It's only going to improve. Uh, and it it could dramatically change the way that we think about work. Um, so, you know, for example, as an engineer, I may not be the most uh, eloquent, you know, in terms of forming a a, a, a verbal statement, um, but I could use artificial intelligence if I if I understand a concept and I can convey it 
using a tool that helps me convey it, I think that's that's good use of the the sophisticated technology, uh, you know, and the and the world and the way that the world is is providing these tools for us. I think we can evolve with it. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, I think humans have demonstrated a remarkable ability to adapt uh, historically and in evolutionary terms. Uh, uh, and I really appreciate your you're bringing up the the chat gpt you're you're the first professor that we've spoken to since chat gpt you know dropped mm -hmm. like a, <laughs> a, a month ago and um really appreciate that i guess a um, optimistic response mm, uh yeah, okay. or an and, and adaptive response you know rather than like oh my gosh you know we're, we're going to have an onslaught of cheating now what what are we going to do about this it's like well you know uh we will figure it out the the, the uh, teaching uh pr profession yeah. will will teach it out it, it uh will figure it out and figure out a way to um, incorporate this new technology in, into um the daily lives of the students and teachers here's another analogy you know you could take a math test uh, uh, where, uh, you know, the instructor might say no calculators. And my attitude is it's not like calculators are going away. In fact, they're getting easier and easier to get access to machine based calculation tools. And so I think of that as an extension of the human cognition. If we can reach for a tool that is easily available and to use it and to use it for work that human, you know, human cognition is not the best tool for mental math. Machines are better than human brains at that, right? Uh, and so when a human can recognize, hey, I can, I can spend my cognitive energy on the aspects of a task or an environment that humans are good at processing, and I can use tools, you know, for the things that I'm, I'm not as good as a machine at doing, I think that's, that's a reasonable way to, to look at the future, you know? Uh, and so right. like the same way we, you know, we can no longer say, uh, you know, here, here's a, an exam where you could just look up the answer on the internet from your, the, the supercomputer in your pocket. You know, we need to think about it differently uh, in terms of what we're testing and how we're, how we're evaluating what people are learning mm -hmm. and really the skill sets that humans will need to polish for the future when we have automation and other technologies that are doing things better and better for us. Mm, right. Yeah. So uh, I forget how I came on to the topic of cognitive ergonomics. I, I think a previous guest on this podcast uh, during one of our like post recording discussions, this this a guest brought up the concept of cognitive ergonomics. And I was like, yeah. wow, that's 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 fascinating. I've never thought about cognitive ergonomics. And so <laughs> just a little a, a little behind the scenes here. So I, I I Googled cognitive ergonomics and blam, you know, uh, Professor Tom Ferris at Texas A&M. You were like like <laughs> the, the number one Google hit uh, for, hey, co all right. <laughs> for cognitive ergonomics. And so I was like, all right, well, let me uh, connect up with Tom. So uh, cognitive ergonomics, a uh, fascinating concept. So uh, some in our audience may be unfamiliar with, with this field. Uh, so how do you introduce this topic typically to uh, someone who, who might be completely unfamiliar with it? Thank you. Yes, I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to explain it. So first of all, um, the term cognitive ergonomics, if you call me a cognitive ergonomist, I'd say yes. If you said are you, a, you know, human factors? I'd say, yes, a human factors engineer. I'm a cognitive systems person. I, I can I can have a few different labels for what I study and what my expertise is, I suppose. Um, but the bottom line is, so ergonomics, ergo, Greek for work, uh, nomics, I, I suppose, the study of work. Okay, so it's, mm. it's how do humans interface in a work environment, a work context. Um, now, if you've heard the term ergonomic, before it's usually related to how people physically interface in an environment. So I have an ergonomic desk chair, which fits my physical body well, that allows me to do my work well. I maybe have an ergonomic hand tool, for example, that is designed well to work with human biomechanics and human anatomy. Um, so a cognitive ergonomist looks at the human cognitive functions. So attention, decision-making, sensation and perception, um, you know, our, our ability to pay attention to multiple things at once and where is the limit in that, you know, multitasking, 
that and and how do humans then interface with these functions in the work environment that's what i study so i'm interested in decision making in context i'm interested in how much can you do in a multitasking context uh what are you uh, aware of paying attention to and what are you missing you know so like your awareness of the situation around you in whatever the the work context and typically what i'm studying what i'm thinking about are usually one human in a system so i've done work for example with uh, drivers and driving simulation sorts of testing where we're looking at driver decision making um i've done work with uh, uh, medicine and looking at you know the attentional demands of an anesthesiologist who's monitoring a patient you know during surgery and the tasks demands that they have and how do those you know fit into the workflow uh, I've done work with aviation where we look at you know pilot situation awareness awareness of their surroundings of their flight context um, and, and so each of these you know other domains as well the, the idea is you've got humans trying to do a whole lot of things and we know that sometimes there are breakdowns there are human mm -hmm. errors there are times where there will be uh, you know an overload of too much data can't you know the human can't keep up with uh, paying attention to you know, processing everything they need to. Um, so then we look at the system around the people. This is again, the ergonomic angle. The system around the human can be designed to best support that human's cognitive capabilities. So the same way I make a chair that will fit, you know, the shape of my body, I can make a, a system around the human to, to shape the way that their cognition allows them to perform in that work context. Wow. So, uh, yeah. So, so many, so many potential, <laughs> potential follow-up uh, uh, directions, but two, two things that come to mind for me. Well, for, first of all, we, we had a, uh, a great discussion with a Air Force pilot, um, Hazard Lee, who is a F-35 pilot. And he, he talked about some of these concepts as well. We, I don't believe we, we didn't use cognitive ergonomics, but the, the whole notion of mm -hmm. serving, serving up information in this case, to a aircraft pilot in a way that, uh, you know, uh, helps the pilot orient and reduce the cognitive load so that, uh, uh, in this case, Hazard Lee uh, could, can, can apply human sense-making to um, uh, activities which require human sense-making, but then AI and, and technology and things that reduce the cognitive load, take care of things that can be uh, uh, to help reduce the friction in that mm -hmm. way. That's, that's number one. And number two, when you talked about uh, anesthesiologist, um, uh, you know, there's, there's been a couple of times in my life when I've been put under for a surgery. And every mm -hmm. time, every time I do it, um, I, I always grab the anesthesiologist in the room and, and, and I tell that person, you are my number one person in the entire world right, <laughs> right, right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. I, Anyway, so that that's that's really interesting that the 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 uh, versatility of of this field and how it applies to so many different um, vocations. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the strengths of, you know, that I, I tell students also. Um, is and I, I do work in a lot of different domains, but the one universal constant is they have humans in them, and human cognition is something that can be generally described and studied. So if I'm interested in how do I improve somebody's multitasking performance, that can be done in a generic way, right? So I could say that that might be in a driving context, in a flight context, in a military context, you know, whatever, <laughs> really, frankly, wherever the, the funding sources take me um, or the problems are, right? Um, but in general, yeah, we, we always try to say, let's boil this down to a basic human science question so that we can apply what we learn fairly broadly. I think that's a pretty, pretty universal in our, uh, in our field. Uh, you know, Tom, so, so we had a conversation before we hit record here. And uh, you know, something that occurs to me is that homo sapiens sapiens, you know, us, <laughs> uh, our, our lineage, I think, traces back, I think, maybe 100,000 years or something like that, where, where if, if you were to grab a human from 
50,000 years ago and, and bring that baby into, the, into today's world, that baby would be able to grow up and be a flourishing human being just like us. I, so I, I guess the point that I'm trying to get after here is there are some foundational uh, traits which are common to all people these days. So what is that? So how, how do you look at that as, you know, kind of like a, like a first principles type of approach to building the field of cognitive ergonomics? Do you, do you this, get what I'm asking there? Yeah, I think so. This is a great question. It, it, it plays well into a, a good answer, I hope. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so one of the areas I'm particularly interested in my students and I look at are what I'll call humans in interesting or cognitively challenging contexts. So consider that most of the problems humans find themselves in in, in the world involve some sort of unusual circumstance uh, that they have to handle cognitively. And one of the, you know, I can talk very generically and just say there is a threatening stressor in my environment. So if we go back to our, our 50,000 years ago, uh, you know, example, um, humans were well conditioned to, uh, to react to, to stressors in that environment. Now, 50,000 years ago, there weren't sophisticated machines. There were sophisticated machines, I should say, but they're not what they are today, right? Um, and, and so the, um, the human role in interacting with them has gotten more and more complex, more and more demanding. Um, but the human, the human uh, 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 tendency to react to stress has not changed, or or the ways that we react to stress. So fifty thousand years ago, you know, if I'm if I'm sitting around the fire or whatever, and uh, something rustles in the in the in the bushes, and a tiger jumps out, I have a stress reaction, and we sometimes we call this the fight or flight response. And the way that actually works is your your um, your um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, your autonomous nervous systems, prepare your body to handle these stressors. The way that it prepares your body to handle those stressors works very well for run away from a tiger. Okay, so some of the things that happen under stress, um, and I'm talking like extreme stress, like I, I fear for my life, maybe, um, you will have an enhancement of human spatial awareness. So my awareness of where the tiger is and any spatial characteristics about the tiger and where my potential escape routes are, these will come to mind more easily, which helps me, right? Um, but as a consequence or as a cost, it, I'm also suppressed in my higher order thinking. I'm not going to be able to give an eloquent speech to the tiger to tell him not to eat me. Uh, I'm not going to be able to come up with a creative problem solving uh, sort of solution in in the small amount of time I have to figure out how to get away. Um, so, like I said, this works well if I'm trying to get away from a tiger. I'm going to be heightened awareness of of how to do that. But now, you know, fast forward fifty thousand years, and now this you know Neanderthal baby is now flying a, a you know an aircraft, yeah. and yeah. things start to go wrong, and they fear for their lives just like they would if a tiger was in front of them. But now it's, you know, looking for an escape route, looking for, you know, what's the simplest, fastest solution is not usually going to be the best idea. We need to potentially think outside the box, potentially come up with a solution that has never been tried before. And there, you know, there's a number of really great examples of excellent, you know, um, human pilots who have been dealt uh, with this sort of situation and have, you know, come up with creative solutions, but it's usually... Those are the exceptional cases, you know, and those are the ones that we try to design to support. Um, so I like to look at that sort of a context and say, in my research lab, we have a driving simulator and we can study, you know, humans in a driving environment, how they make decisions, what they pay attention to, et cetera. But we're not really replicating very effectively that fight or flight sort of mentality. Uh, and so there's a number of things we do do in our lab to try to get people closer to that sort of a mindset without ever putting them in heightened danger. That's always the balance here, right? We want them to feel the effects of danger being present, and we want them to take it, you know, seriously, uh, but we obviously don't want to put them in danger. Um, so there's, you know, there's a number of tricks we use for that. We're using a lot more 
um, you know, immersive sorts of tools, virtual reality and things to get people in, in these mindsets. Um, but it's a, it's a continual challenge that we have. It's one of the ways that I think my lab sort of uh, distinguishes itself, you know, among others who work in these areas is we're really interested in those in those extreme cognitive states. So, so you know, I, I've mentioned stress, um, but if you get workload high enough, you can get similar sorts of responses. Um, you know, where I'm interested in things like surprise, you know, when people are surprised, how do they process their environment? What changes? Um, you know, what happens under different emotional loads? So uh, I recently had a uh, uh, one of my, my recent graduates, uh, uh, Dr. Saya Susandar, uh, she just completed her her dissertation on uh, e emotional aspects of driving and and trying to find ways to help emotional drivers, whether that's anger, you know, road rage sorts of contexts, or even like really heightened positive emotions. Each of those states changes the way that we process risk and the way that we accept risk. And so we're trying to get realistic driving sorts of behavior. Uh, when people are under those contexts, but we're instilling these, you know, through through different sorts of emotional uh, applications. Uh, but in general, it's we're dealing with, you know, how human cognition has evolved over long, long periods of time, you know, eons, you know, thousands of years, tens, hundreds of thousands of years. And now with the rapid pace of technology advancement, the humans are kind of in a in a in a premature stage for handling problems in those contexts. I, I, I think you could say that, yeah. uh, but it's also, you know, humanity is not going to change on the scale, um, you know, that, that will, will, will change the way we behave there. So we design the system around humans, know, knowing that. Mm, mm, yeah. Right. So it, it is one of your assumptions then, you know, coming to your last point there, one of your assumptions that is that um, humans are, fixed relative to certain attributes just making that assumption yeah. when, when building a yeah. system around people yeah I, I i think okay so human nature i i think it's probably a, a fair thing to say that if humans could eliminate the effects of stress it would be a good thing you know stress is unpleasant right um but it also shapes us it it, it prepares us for survival right um, and, and I don't, I don't think that's going to, you know, change in any appreciable way in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so, um, recognizing that human nature, that innate, uh, way that we respond to stresses and knowing that stress will always be part of the work context with life context, et cetera. Um, we can then say, okay, well, that's, that's here to stay just like, just like anything where we're designing around the human the human is the hardest thing to change. Uh, the oh, technologies yeah. mm -hmm. and the system around the human can be designed and redesigned and refined on a much faster, you know, iteration. Um, so, uh, so the human is usually the hardest piece to fit, and therefore we say, well, build the system around the human so that you ensure it fits. Mm, right. <laughs> um, I forget whether this was something that I read um, or it was a comment that a previous podcast guest made, but I wanted to get your take on this. Uh, it goes something like this. Like it, if you were to take somebody from the 1500s and somehow you could just port this person to today and you, you, you don't give them any context or anything, it's just like, poof, they are all of a sudden uh, in the year 2023 that they would... Uh, their minds would would almost literally be blown because of the experiences that are available to us today are so uh, dissonant with whatever their lived experiences are from the 1500s that it would it would mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. literally kill them or you know put put them into, yeah. some, in, in, into some sort of a state where where they just couldn't function because nothing makes sense to to. Yeah to their senses do you yes. think that there's something to that yes um so um i i teach a class um it's called uh, human information processing hmm. and one of the things we we do in that class is we go we go back to the earliest moment of humans 
interfacing with the physical environment to 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 gain information, and that's through our senses. Um, but I, I typically talk, I, I go all the way down to the level of, you know, electromagnetic radiation strikes the retina uh, cells oh. on the back of my eye, which then transform the signal into a, a, a neural pattern, you know, a code of of action potentials, which ultimately, you know, combines, you know, there's a, there's many steps here, and then it ultimately combines with my past experience and my current knowledge for me to interpret what yeah. that sensory data gives me. So this 1500s uh, person, they are going to have a certain understanding of the of their world, and they're going to be then put in this world, and they'll get sensory data, you know, all the same sensory data that you or I get, but the way that they'll interpret that data will be based on their 1500s brain and, and experience and knowledge. So they'll look at something like, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a automobile, a vehicle, yeah, and yeah. they they may be familiar with things like horse drawn carriages. They, you know, I'm trying to think 1500s, yeah, right? Of in, course, uh, but, in an airplane, maybe you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the way they would perceive it, it would look, it would be strange, but they would still attempt to interpret it according to their own knowledge and experience. Ah. So they may look at a vehicle, uh, a current vehicle today, and they may see it for the wheels that are there and they'll recognize okay there are wheels on these you know on on horse-drawn carriages and they will see it as a horse-drawn carriage that somehow doesn't have a horse um or they'll see it in so, you know some way that's difficult for me to describe because i don't have a 1500s brain um but there are a number of examples in my human information processing class where you can show people hey here's this unique context where a a well-developed human uh didn't have the normal knowledge that you would expect and when they encountered this event they interpreted it differently um and there are some cultural aspects of that so things for example like how we interpret hues how we interpret color right um has a lot to do with what colors are meaningful in our culture and frankly whether or not we have a label for them do we have a word that goes with that that interpretation because that word is what is stored in my memory in a meaningful way and if i don't have a label you know if i can't say hey this is blue or this is green um it's just some vibrant thing um and i don't have the words for it, it, it it's harder for me to process it um so there are examples for example um i i, I go into a couple of readings by helen keller right so most people have heard of Helen Keller, they know they know of her as uh, you know being a blind and deaf uh, child, and then learning to read through haptic input. Um, what you maybe don't know is that you know she lived a long and very impressive life. She learned to speak ver verbal, and if you think about no eyes or hearing, how do you learn to speak? And that's that's a that's a, a story in itself. She was giving keynote addresses, you know, graduation speeches by the, you know, by the end of her life. She wrote books. So she's an amazing uh, case study. And some of the things she describes are how she basically her experience of life before and after the invention to her or the realization of language and the ability to label things and to know, oh, this sensation i'm getting which you know primarily you know no no eyes or or, or auditory input so it's primarily you know haptic olfactory the, or, or other senses but any of that sensory data now she knows oh this has a meaning this has a word this has some sort of label that goes with it and now i can understand that as a concept but prior to that it's just streaming sensory data that is not really you know not assigned any sort of meaning and so, you know, the same way, like you take a 1500s person and we're going to we're going to give them, a, you know, some sort of experience that is is completely foreign to them and completely new. And they'll do the best they can to associate labels with it, but they'll interpret it based on their their current understanding of the world. So, um, you know, so the, the Ellen Keller example is is pretty is pretty fantastic to read, to talk about how. You know, she has this, oh, and then everything snapped. And now I understand, you know, how language plays a role in, 
in, in my realization of everything. Um, and then there are other cases, you know, there's a, there's a famous story um, and it's sort of, um, sort of dubious at how true this is or how exact it is, but <laughs> okay. there, there's, it's a good story anyway. And it, they talk about uh, Native American people observing some of the first large ships coming over from, from England and, you know, having no concept. I mean, these Native peoples, they, they knew boats and things like that, but having no concept of a ship the, of the scale and size that we're approaching. And so the way that this gets described is sensory data that doesn't register with a realization. So it's it's kind of like what you said they they almost can't process it. And and so that's kind of a way to describe, yeah, my eyes are receiving the light from this this unexplainable thing, but because it doesn't match anything, it doesn't match well enough anything I already have in my own experience and knowledge, I don't perceive it. And and that's a really really deep thing to say, a strong thing to say. I sense it, but don't perceive it. And that's because sensation just requires physical energies to reach our sensory organs. Perception requires interpreting those data according to what we understand about the world. Mm, um, right. Well, it, 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 that that reminds me for some reason about the, the old... Uh, philosophical question of if, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? And it's like, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, <laughs> no, on the other hand, no. If there, if there's no uh, uh, sensors there to sense it and then perceive the sound, then it's like it didn't happen. Yeah, I, I, I see where you, I see, I, 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 you're picking up what I'm laying down. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. I can't argue with that. I would say yeah. uh yeah, if there's not a human there to receive that sensory data, then there is no perception of sound. That is definitely that is definitely sayable. Um yeah, but it's a it, it's an interesting way to look at even when um humans are present, how they may be fully aware of some things or really it's just one example of some of the ways right in our environment right in front of us Something may look really obvious to an external observer, but to the human, you know, who's who's the processor there, there are some surprising ways that they don't get everything, or they don't, or they misinterpret things, or they interpret things, you know, that 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 lead them down, you know, uh, an inadvisable path, you know, for example. You know, something that occurs to me, Tom, is that you and your colleagues and fellow researchers in this space must try to accommodate the various different human sensing modalities when you are constructing systems. Would you say that that's right? Yes, yes. Um, and that, that's a big part of, of what I'm studying as well. The, if you're going to interface with a human, your interfacing ports, so to speak, are the sensory channels, right? And so it's good to know the you know, the limits and the abilities of those channels and their strengths. And so, for example, we're mostly talking about vision, audition, and the sense of touch, haptics. Um, of course, we have more senses than that. But most of the time, if you're interfacing a human with, you know, you're putting them in a cockpit or you're putting them in a work context, these are the senses you have to work with. The visual channel is excellent for processing spatial orientation, spatial sorts of properties. Um, and other channels are better for other dimensions. So, for example, audition is better for judging things in time, which kind of makes sense. This is this is the channel that we use to, you know, to listen to things, to, to, to you know, musically, rhythmically, that, that we, we go with our auditory channel. Uh, if you've ever taken, you know, like a, a sound file and, and visualized it and tried to make sense of the visualization without the audition, it, it, it gets lost. It's not, you know, the visual channel is not as good at tracking things in time. Um, and so, you know, for example, if you have uh, something you need a human to do, which relies on where things are, you probably want a visual element, a visual component to it. If it's when things occur, you probably want some sort of auditory component to it. Um, so as a real simple example, I like to talk about, um, you know, this, you know, one of the ways that I applied this in, in a very important work domain, which is playing Mario Party with my children. <laughs> so, 
right? So, so you get one of these games where it's, um, you know, uh, don't press any button until the target comes up or until the, you know, you know, and it's the, who can press the button the fastest once, once they say, okay, ready, go. Uh, and so what I'll always, you know, I'll always recommend is try not to use your visual channel to recognize when you need to react, use your auditory channel. So if there's any sort of auditory cue, you're actually about 10 milliseconds faster in reacting to it if you're relying on the auditory cue to, to be your trigger as opposed to the visual one. And that has a little bit to do with the processing time difference, you know, for, you know, at our central processor once that data, you know, reaches our sensory organs. Ah, so uh, a a uh, Jedi mind trick, uh, so to speak. Put a cover on your eyes and, yep. and, and you'll do better. Wow, that's awesome. And, and it happens at a scale that you don't, notice until you're playing mario party and then you try it out and oh yeah that's actually i can go a little bit faster right yeah, yeah. it's the, this the timing difference that our central processor handles with all of the multiple senses is is also a pretty pretty interesting topic um and if you think about it you know my ears and my eyes are very close to my central processor they don't have very far to send that neural signal before it can be interpreted at the central processor. However, you know, I've got parts of my body with senses that are further away. And I always like to talk about, you know, my toes, which are some of the furthest from my brain. And you have sensation in your toes. But one interesting way to recognize this sort of time factor is when you stub your toe. So if you're, you know, you're like me, you're walking around and not paying attention and you accidentally kick a table, uh, you'll notice you have sort of two phases of perception. So the first phase would be your, you have a realization of the mechanical, uh, uh, you know, the, the, what you expected to happen with your limbs is not happening. Some, you know, something in the trajectory of your swinging leg has changed. And so that's going to be some of the, you know, the force and the stretch receptors that you have in your joints and in your, you know, in your toes. Um, those are going to be sending signals fairly rapidly to the to the central nervous system, to the you know spinal cord. And we're going to realize those that we're going to have that perception first. So we first have this confusing moment where it's I noticed that my foot is not where it should be. I thought it was going to be here and it's not there. And then you have the wave of pain which comes. And the reason that you feel those in two successive, you know, events is because of this essentially the speed limit of the neural transduction that comes from your toe. So our motor nerves are, are, are you know, the ones that control our, our muscles and our, our sensory channels in the skin are faster. They're, the term is myelinated. They have, you know, a, a faster transmission time than nociceptors, pain receptors, and pain nerves. Those are slower in response. So we get these two phases and that that phase, that difference becomes that much more noticeable when it's further and further away from our central processor, like where our toes are. Yeah. Right, right. And so all of these um, realities of the way uh, senses come into our cognition uh, can can get fed back into system design. Uh, That's right. Now, yeah. I, w one one last question, and I I don't intend for this to be a silly question, and yeah, you know, don't please don't feel <laughs> please don't take a whole lot of time answering it. But uh, sure. uh, yeah, I mean ser seriously though, I'm do 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 things like like taste uh, or uh, start. Are there any ways that the sensation of taste? is getting integrated into human machine interfaces uh, that help with the cognitive processing. Like I, I'm thinking yeah. of like, 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 like novel, novel applications of, of taste in, in a way, in ways that might not be especially intuitive. So I, I don't have any great examples off the top of my head, but I know that yes, there's work in this space. It just tends to be a little more in the, Let's make a story about it when it looks like Willy Wonka is is going to come come to life. You know, when we can taste our TV, for example, by yeah, looking at like, it. Something. I see. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so um, the sense of taste is kind of a combination of our olfactory chemical sensing. You know, you know, you get a lot of the same receptors as in the in the nose, um, and haptics. So there are some groups that have used the tongue as a haptic display space 
uh, because it's hypersensitive, right? You can get some pretty good resolution. And so, for example, there was a group uh, from the University of Wisconsin, uh, uh, Paul Bakirita is the name, and, and uh, uh, his group uh, had developed a electrotactile array that then interfaced with a camera and then blind folk could, you know, the camera could process the image and map it out in a, a uh, an array on the tongue that gives, you know, foreground and background sorts of data. Um, so to some degree, there's some sensory substitution that can be, you know, we can use these other channels, but I think what olfaction and taste are uniquely good for are chemical, you know, chemical detection. And we use that in, you know, in our everyday lives all the time. You, what's that bad smell? And maybe it's something, you know, that um, relates to something I need to do or people around me need to do. Maybe it's a, a, oh. a clue of danger, you know, smoke or or, or like the, smell. the or, or the uh, artificial scent that is put into natural gas, right? Yep. So that so, so that we recognize that natural gas is is present, and and then that affects our cognition, and we know to get yep. out or to investigate quickly <laughs> so that yep. we, uh, yep. yeah, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, yep. well, th this has been a terrific conversation, Tom. I, I like to ask two, two close out questions and, uh, if, if we could real quick. So we, we have, um, a, a bunch of students who listen to this podcast. Uh, could you offer a, a, a fruitful research question that maybe a master's or, or maybe a PhD student could take a crack at uh, um, Excellent. along these lines. And also what is one of your like go-to books for people to check out if they want a deeper dive into this topic? Okay, great questions. Um, so maybe I'll answer the second one first because the first one might, I might <laughs> trail on a little bit. Um, but I, I've got a great book um, that I usually recommend. I hand out to, you know, I, I, I loan it out to people. It is a pop science book, sort of um, very readable, and it's it's a, it's it's a fairly popular book, I think. So it's a design of everyday things by Don Donald Norman. Donald Norman, the design of everyday things uh, is was originally published under the title "The Psychology of Everyday Things," and uh, without changing any of the content, the title changed because it it really recognized. I'm studying human psychology, but applying it to the systems, the design of items around them. And so uh, what Norman does is he does a great job, several uh, uh, you know, basic lessons and then very practical, very relatable examples, you know, things like door handles. How does a door handle communicate to a human how we should interact with it? And so taking a fairly simple thing, everyday thing, you know, that that was all around us and breaking down why is it designed this way or what are some basic aspects of this design we might think about that would make it even easier for humans to work with. Um, he also goes into things like, you know, emotional design. So what we were talking about earlier, how humans make decisions that are different when they're under an emotional load. Well, you can design a tool that plays into certain positive or, or you know, plays into emotions that work well for the task at hand, right? Um, so, so I would say that's a great book, uh, design of everything, everyday things by Don Norman. It's a, it's a, you can read it, a, you know, when falling asleep, it's not, you know, a, a deep text, um, but very, very enjoyable, um, research topics though. So, um, a lot of what I am working on right now is human sensing. And the interesting aspect of that is, so if we want to get some insight into what's happening cognitively with a human, um, we don't have like a scope that we can easily you know, put up to the brain and look inside. We have technologies that can give us clues about what's going on internally, but there also tend to be really obvious obtrusive things. You say this term obtrusive. If I put someone in my driving simulator and they have a 64 electrode EEG cap on, it's hard to ignore that cap and to try to think like, oh, I'm in a natural environment. So you know, we look for ways to not remind people that they're in a study, but to get true sorts of insight into what's going on cognitively. And so we, you know, we're looking, it's, it's a great research space because there's a lot of things that can be done with physiology. And so, you know, we're looking at cardiac patterns, uh, skin, you know, uh, the, the c conductance of skin, the surface of the skin changes when we get certain stress responses. So we can, we can detect that and we can sense, Hey, our, 
our driver or our operator is now under a higher workload state. And what do we do about that? Um, but those algorithms, those, um, you know, the metrics that we use to infer those states are still pretty rough. And there's still a lot of room to uh, improve them. We're using, you know, in the research world, more and more sophisticated machine learning sorts of ways to say, you know, here's all of the ways the human body changes when the tiger jumps out. Uh, and we can sense those and we can make a smarter and smarter algorithm for inferring what's going on and what the abilities are uh, cognitively. Um, so human sensing, you know, finding ways to measure workload, stress, emotional loading. Um, there's there's a lot of good space there, um, you know, for research. Uh, the other side of that coin, I suppose, so for sensing what's going on with the humans, it's now we can design for what we know about the human. So if somebody gets into my my car of the future and the car can detect through, you know, galvanic skin response through some sort of, you know, elevated heart rate or whatever, it can detect this is an angry human. This is a road rager. Um, then I can say, all right, well, now what does the car do about that? So we can change the way that humans, you know, perceive the various risks in their environment. We can give them reminders about you know, hey, when you're in this state, you tend to be more, you know, more more willing to do these things that you wouldn't normally be. Uh, and so we can kind of look at ways to shape behavior to make it safer, make it, you know, more effective in those systems. So that's my second, my second part on, um, you know, potential research directions are once we know when humans are in these states, what can we do about it to make systems work better? So like, uh, like, like branching dynamics that, uh, you know, under this, under this scenario, uh, present this design under another scenario, present this design in order to accommodate the way humans tend to react differently under different circumstances. That's, that's a great way to describe it. Yeah. Or, or, or if the system is able to detect that the human may be trending towards a less than optimal decision-making context, it can nudge them back in the right way, give them more information, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, call attention to the fact that, hey, under this cognitive state, you are willing to jump into a little more risky situations, you know, and so you can kind of second guess on that too. So, but yeah, finding ways to, um, you know, respond to that human state it, within the system, that's a pretty broad sort of problem space but it's one where you know it's there's there's a lot of fruit to be had, I suppose, in the research yeah. world. Yeah, that is awesome. I guess it started uh, getting into like control theory and control science and stuff like that. Uh, that is awesome, awesome. Well, my goodness. Well, Tom, you've given us a lot to think about, and uh, with that, Dr. Tom Ferris, thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. Oh, it was my pleasure, John. Thank you so much. Great to great to talk with you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.